fam was one of the richest fam in the world. But not with money. But not with money. With love, kindness, tolerance, and patience. Qualities that's worth more than money. That's worth more than money. And you can't buy that. They taught me how to love people for who they are, not what I want them to be. They taught me how to get along with people. They taught me to treat people the way I want to be treated. They taught me to treat each person for who they are, and not clump them together because we all different in our own. the richness that I was brought up with. Hello and welcome to this edition of TZM Global Radio. I'm your host for today, Jim Phillips or James Phillips from the Zeitgeist Movement UK chapter and TZM Education. Hope you're all doing well out there. The introduction to today's show is a nice little piece of narrative from a documentary I watched recently called The 1%, which was actually filmed by the son of someone who is in The 1%, a uh, rather rich man <laughs> to say the least or may perhaps rich in a slightly different way which this particular character in the documentary lays out excellently when he's talking about the way he was brought up and the family he was brought up in and what in his eyes it truly means to be a rich man on this earth and I think he puts it very very well albeit that he did it whilst he was trying to reverse his truck so you get uh, the squeak of his uh, handbrake as he pulls it up and various other things probably emanating from his rather poor standard of vehicle but then you know no worries rich guys whilst you're out there everybody else's cars works absolutely fine you've got no need to worry that they're poor and that they probably can't afford to actually get them fixed and then how much is your car worth when you've completely totaled it at 100 miles an hour on the motorway because you were driving next to someone who couldn't afford to keep theirs not to mention the fact that you don't even need to actually drive a car in such a manner anymore because we have technology that can stop cars from bashing into each other but don't have the money for it oh well onwards and upwards so let's start off with a little bit of movement news obviously z-day is just on the horizon uh, only a couple of weeks to go now and i went through the basic rationale for the nature of that presentation in the last radio show they also included the interview with Raul Reynolds from the band Enter Shikari. If you haven't had a chance to give that show a listen, I highly recommend uh, downloading it because I had a lot of fun uh, recording the interview. And it's also got a little bit of information on there about London Z-Day. Uh, London Z-Day now has all of our speakers confirmed. As I said in last week's show, we are having guest speakers come along that whilst they may not necessarily agree in um, totality with what we talk about, they are recognising a very important um, attribute of what we discuss and working towards changing that. So I think it's far better that we l have that outward looking approach and make these connections with these exterior organisations. It will only give the movement more room, if you will, to plant seeds in a, in a sense, loosening up the mud and making it more fertile to plant our seeds for the train of thought necessary for a truly global sustainable society. And we've got a really exciting um, list of speakers lined up for London and we've nearly sold out all our tickets. So do go online and type Z Day 2013 London into Google and have a look at uh, the lineup of our speakers because I'm sure it's going to be a really excellent day. A little later on in the show, I'm going to be continuing to read from the book The First Civilization by Jess Garcher in my audio book series for that. But some more exciting news is that we've got the wonderful Federico Pistono coming to visit us here in the UK. Lucky us. Um, in fact, Federico is going to be helping me do a presentation next Friday at a secondary school. And he's going to be giving a talk to the entire sixth form 
at the school and then we're going to be taking them through to the science and sustainability exhibition that I've got for them all to take a look around there and me and Fed will show them around that. On Sunday, Federico has been invited to give a talk for the Socialist Party of Great Britain. Uh, the details of which are Sunday, March the 10th, 6 till 9pm at the Socialist Party of Great Britain head office, which is on 52 Clapham High Street, London, SW4, 7UN. But if you just go to the Zeitgeist Movement Meetup page, London chapter, then you should be able to find all the details for the event through that. Um, so, yeah, that would be that should be really, really great. Looking forward to having Federico over in the UK. So I think that's about it for movement news. Now, I have to be honest, I'm on a little bit of a high today, ladies and gentlemen, um, uh, a natural high, <laughs> um, because I've just come back from my daughter's primary school and I gave a presentation on the universe and space, which is a uh, little pet interest of mine. So uh, just to blow a few minds and in a way, I think I figured that this is planting seeds if you sort of show kids just how amazing the universe is and how small our place is within it, how delicate the balance actually is with regards to sustaining life on this planet and, and get their minds outside the box and, and show them the value in science and how it has updated our understanding of the universe in which we live then in a way, without you even mentioning the RBE, because of course these kids are like 10 and the school is uh, Church of England and things like that, so you can't go too much into it, but you're planting seeds. Like I, I even go through in the presentation um, something to do with evolution and how that takes place. And it's not something they actually have had a chance to even learn about in my daughter's school yet properly, evolution. So at least if you're just putting it in there, then uh, th that's at least something for them to be able to um, to get their uh, intellectual teeth into, if you will, at an early age and start blowing some brain cells. So, um, so yeah, that was really, really good. They really enjoyed it. We played a solar system game in the playground where we had um, nine chairs, one being the sun and the other eight being the planets of the solar system. So, yeah, we played like this solar system game where they all got a planet and they had to run to the nearest chair and work together to, in order to make sure that they... Um, beat their time each time to see if they can get to the chairs correctly quicker so um, learning their planets through play so all in all it was basically a really really uh, fun morning I had a lot of fun doing it and, and the kids had a lot of fun as well so I thought that that, that plus the fact that Z-Day is coming up is a perfect opportunity to just include a little audio um, lecture from a past Z day as a sort of warm up, if you will, a primer towards this Z day, and it is one of the um, classic Z day talks <laughs> by Doug Millette. And the title of this presentation, rather aptly considering what I uh, did at my daughter's school this morning, is called Space Exploration and Sustainability. Now, just before I get started with that. Um, and include that audio here, I would just like to say, I realize many of you may have well heard this lecture and, and seen it online. So apologies if I'm doubling up slightly here, but as was explained on a few radio shows ago, I, I will occasionally do this because I think it is good to get a reminder of the train of thought from a different angle and good to just reinforce some of the information given in some of these talks and just to hear them again because I know that many of you may download these to your iPods or mp3 players as I do and, and have them playing as you go around because we can't always be glued to a laptop watching YouTube lectures so it's always good to get a, a second dose if you will of a really really great lecture so I'm going to include that here so this is Doug Millette at Z Day 2012 enjoy are we having a good time? Good. Good. I'm glad I got some enthusiasm. The zombie apocalypse isn't supposed to be till the end of the year, so I was hoping everybody wasn't going to be like, uh, so that's good. All right. So we went through the introduction, so let's get into the meat and potatoes of what we're going to discuss. Of course, now I get to come up after Federico and James, so great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Not that there hasn't been a standard set. 
What I'm going to talk about is basically related to my passion, space exploration and development. I have been passionately involved in space exploration ever since I was a child, which is what motivated me to become an aerospace systems engineer, uh, which afforded me the capabilities to work with the space shuttle program and see how things operate on the inside. And this actually is what benefited me to understand what the RBE was all about. Because when I saw Zeitgeist Addendum, and I saw the solution sets offered by the Venus Project towards the end of the film, in my brain I went, well, yeah, that's how a Mars base would have to work. In fact, if you were to talk to most people in the space industry, those principles and those characteristics are taught. That is how we run things. And so the ability to go from one medium to the other wasn't a very large leap for me. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about space exploration and sustainability and kind of discuss how those things are comparative and brought together. And we're going to do it with the Mars-based thought experiment. Now this is something that most people typically don't do at their home. They don't think about space exploration in this way. But I want you guys to think for a moment what would be necessary for a group of astronauts to survive on a hostile world that has two-year, at the earliest, logistic windows, which means you can't get resupplied easily by going to the grocery store down the street. There is no grocery store down the street. So what kind of practices, what kind of things need to be covered for the astronauts? Well, there are really two primary sets of conditions. You have your biological needs, the things that keep the creature known as the human being alive, and you have your quality of life needs, the things that make life just a little bit above standard. And so these processes have been thought about already. The Apollo program was not supposed to be a flag sticking one shot to the moon. Yay, we did it. There were plans in place to build a moon base. There were thoughts and panels and discussions on how to provide for astronauts for long duration missions to the moon. These logistic operations happen today with the International Space Station on a regular basis. And so this isn't a foreign concept. In fact, since the 50s, if not earlier, these concepts, thanks to science fiction writers such as Isaac Asimov and many others, have been thought about. So what are the basic necessities of life? Well, here's a good list. Air, food, water, sleep, and medical care. The last two a lot of people seem to not think about. If you don't get quality sleep, that does have a detrimental effect to your biology, psychologically and physically. And when it comes to medical care, it's pretty obvious. If you get broke, you've got to get fixed. Now what about our quality of life? Shelter, clothing, education, energy, transportation, communication. A lot of people can understand these. Now on Mars, well, now that's a little bit different for shelter, isn't it? It's not like you can take a brisk morning stroll in the crisp Martian air. It doesn't quite work that way. So you, your shelter is a biological requirement to keep the astronauts alive. And likewise in the International Space Station, and that in a way kind of ties together clothing and shelter, because those spacesuits that the astronauts wear, when they do an EVA or an extravehicular mission outside of the space station, they need to wear basically a shelter in a suit so that they can exist and perform the functions that are necessary outside of that habitat. So a lot of thought has gone into how do you sustainably do these things because it's very important to remember it's not like the technologies and the knowledge that we gain through space exploration stay in orbit. These things are designed by people on the ground tested by people on the ground. They are developed and put to test on Earth to be used in space. So if we can do it up there, why can't we do it down here? There's also something else to consider. You can't just take 100% of what you need up in space. It doesn't work that way. If you run into a shortage in space, people die. It's really that simple. Likewise, on Earth, especially when you look at the scarcity paradigm that has already been alluded to to the previous lecturers. So abundance 
when we do engineering, we don't do something to 100% of specification. We do something to 120% of specification, 150% to specification. It's an overage. It's a contingency plan. You have backups. Do you think the space shuttle only has one flight computer? Well, of course, the space shuttle's not flying anymore. But do you think the space shuttle did only have one flight computer? Absolutely not. It has three. And they're all redundantly connected. You have to have backups. You have to have redundancy. You have to have abundance. But when it comes to space exploration, we have technical abundance. You see, there's a big difference. You go back 50,000 years to the hunter-gatherers of man, they lived in a paradigm of natural abundance. A really big planet, not a whole lot of them. So it was pretty easy for them to yank whatever they needed wherever they went. And that's exactly what they did. They'd stay in a place for a particular time, hunt what they could, pull what they could from the trees and bushes, fish from the local stream, and when they kind of ran out or the weather changed, they moved along. They lived in a natural abundance paradigm where the earth was perfectly capable of providing everything that they needed to survive. Over time, as populations started to grow and we became a little more advanced, we have started to put a strain on the planet. And so, thanks to our wonderful brains and our innovative technical capabilities, we have developed technical abundance solutions, which mimic nature in very specific ways so that we can provide enough for every man, woman, and child on the planet in the same way that Mother Earth did it 50,000 years ago for a much smaller, smaller population. And when it comes to a Mars base, that is absolutely a necessity. So now, let's talk about some of our technologies for biological needs. Now we're going to focus a little bit on Earth, but I'm going to kind of jump back and forth between the Mars base and the Earth base that we live on. Air, well that's pretty naturally abundant as long as we don't muck it up, right? We're doing a pretty good job of polluting the air, but there's also a concerted effort going into making sure that the air we have is the cleanest possible and that we do things the right way. Now on Mars, there are ways to synthesize and manufacture air, such as electrolysis, which splits water into its contingent components of hydrogen and oxygen, and you breathe the oxygen and you use the hydrogen as a fuel source. So there are ways on another world to make that happen. This is also why water is so important to find on moon, which is why we did the L-Cross mission, which a lot of people thought was bombing the moon, which was the most comical thing I'd ever seen. But considering the fact that the moon is bombarded by asteroids on a regular basis on the backside of the moon, people forget that the moon is the Earth's shield, and it actually sucks up a lot of the rocks that want to come and hit us. So us flying a little dead SUV-sized slug into the, into the moon to see how much water it has on it, it's really no big deal for the moon. Now you've got water, getting back to that. Now on the Earth, we have desalinization plants. We have many tools and ways. And I don't necessarily mean old school desalinization systems. There are clean energy ways, solar power ways to clean, to desalinate water and transport water. And I'll give an example using the NASA spinoff technology. There's a nano mesh that they've created where you can take a bottle of water. Let me get a fresh one. Because this ain't mine. You can take an empty bottle of water, go to the slimiest mud hole in sub-Saharan Africa, run the bottle through, and have this stuff that you definitely would not want to drink. But you run it through this nano mesh material, and out through the other side comes water that you can unscrew the cap and drink directly from the same bottle. Because the nano mesh material literally filters out everything but the water. We have the technological capabilities to do that. There's a bottle called Water for Life. This was developed, in part, with NASA help. NASA creates this spin-off magazine every year. A lot of people don't know about it, but they've been doing it for decades. And it talks about direct NASA innovations that are applicable to everyday life on Earth, and how they have worked with industry to, again, work on projects that have impact on people's everyday life. Like, I don't know, the CAT scan machine? Thanks, NASA. MRI? Thanks, NASA. Kidney dialysis? I mean, the medical industry is loaded 
with space-based applications that were derived because of the NASA program. Then you've got food. Now this is something that I have personally taken on as a way to make a positive impact after I got released from the space shuttle program. You see, I could have gotten a job working with some military contractor doing missiles, bombs, and guns, but I'm not exactly interested in that. So what I've decided to do is put my systems engineering capabilities and merge them with aquaponic systems to create high-tech farms. In short, the goal is to solve the global hunger crisis once and for all by creating fully automated aquaponic farm buildings that are off the grid, self-regulating, self-sustaining, clean energy powered, collects its own water, regulates itself, I can drop it in the middle of nowhere, and it will feed about a thousand people, ten different fruits and vegetables each, constantly for 50 plus years. You see, a lot of people talk about the transition, and they're like, how are we supposed to get from here to there? Well, one of the best ways to do it is to just practice what you preach, isn't it? Let's start developing companies and organizations and institutions that use the existing system with the intent of eroding the existing system. Now we can talk about medical care. Medical care, that device that you see on the left is called the Da Vinci Surgical Assistant. Basically, the surgeon, as you can see, sticks his head in a big Nintendo device. And he starts playing with these little bells and whistles that he's got there at his fingertips. And this surgical assistant is now, has now gone global. It makes surgeries tremendously more precise. The recovery times are 50 to 75% faster than normal. The incisions are smaller. And scars are almost gone as far as how these surgeries are done. And we're talking cardiac surgery. We're talking about throat surgeries. A lot of medical terms that I can't pronounce and don't care to. But you can look up the Da Vinci surgical assistant yourself and see lots of videos and testimony as to how amazing this is. It's kind of funny how this was developed. This was actually a military operation so that this robot could be put in the battlefield and surgeons back at a safe home base could tele-remotely control this surgical assistant and work on wounded soldiers. Of course, the mainstream medical industry said, hell, well, why don't we just do that in hospitals now? And that's exactly what they did. And even more so, imagine putting this in a third world village in the middle of nowhere, and so you might not be able to send a surgeon directly out there, but you sure as hell can send a machine. And so any surgeon anywhere can connect to this system through telecommunications and be able to save people's lives without necessarily having to travel there to do it. Now what about technologies for quality of life? If you notice I skipped the sleep one, well, if you've got food, and shelter, and clothing, and water, and a lot of your needs are met, sleep comes by a hell of a lot easier, doesn't it? Technology for quality of life. Well, thanks, Fed, for stealing my contour crafting thunder. But Federico touched on it. He talked about contour crafting, the ability to build a 2,000 square foot home in 24 hours. Uh, I ended up contacting Dr. Kushnievis shortly after the Haitian earthquake um, because I saw the potential of what was going on uh, and what that could mean and then come to find out, of course, the primary restriction from him being able to develop a full scale prototype was Ah, oh, very intelligent audience. All right, good, yes. Money. He doesn't have the financial backing to build a full-scale prototype. So through a little poking and prodding, I ended up putting him in contact with Peter Joseph, and the next thing you know, he is in a film. Now, clothing and other products. Well, we talked about 3D printing, which is something Federico also stole from my thing. But that's okay. I have props, and he doesn't have props. These are actually 3D printed materials that I got from Bergen in Norway when I was on my Scandinavian lecture tour. I was able to visit a company that does prototype 3D printing and manufacturing. This is a tool or some kind of widget that they devised 
And this is another material that actually has threads. That's how detailed this can get. You can create wrenches, you can create custom tools, you can create cups and plates and silverware, and I also have pictures of titanium 3D printing systems. Yes, we are now getting to the point we are beyond plastic and we are starting to use metals to do that. So imagine living in a world where you custom design your own pots and pans and you have them custom manufactured for you and they are sent to your house. And you're not necessarily restricted to what somebody else thinks is the best design for your kitchenware, but you get to be your own designer if you want to. Or you could peruse a whole bunch of options and blueprints and pick the set that you want and only have that manufactured. So that we no longer have this case of making a whole bunch of product and then advertising the hell out of it to guilt trip people into buying it. You only create what you need. Now communication, it's very difficult to argue against how dynamic and amazing the communication systems are that we have around the world today. Um, I mean, babies these days are born with an umbilical cord with an iPhone attached to it, for crying out loud, or some kind of smartphone. So that is unquestionable in today's day and age, which of course goes right back to education. Now, I know that James touched base on the educational paradigm shift very eloquently, an excellent presentation. I will add to it, with communication and the education combined, there are websites such as conacademy.org. For those of you who don't know what Khan Academy is, it is a free online software, that you, a website that you can go to, and you can learn pretty much any hard science that you want, and they are currently partnering with Google in a way to try and get history and English and other subjects to follow the Khan Academy format. But I'll give it to you in a very short kind of bullet point idea. It's a tree format. Let's say we're doing math. The very first lesson is math edition one. One plus one is two. Kindergarten stuff, starting at the beginning. It goes all the way down to advanced trigonometry, differential calculus, and linear algebra. It goes very complex. And as you pass these lessons, but here's the catch, there's no grades. You have to master a subject before it unlocks the next subjects. So these short 10 minute videos, you watch this short video, which is better for the human brain. We don't want to sit for 45 minutes watching an instructor drone and drone and drone. So you get these 10 minute videos on a particular topic, you do the lesson, you have to answer 10 questions in a row accurately, and that is what allows you to move on. And throughout the process, you earn badges and points, and there's kind of a game system to it, so it's also fun to do. And it's great for kids, such as my daughter. I have an eight year old daughter now, her name is Angelique, and when she was about six and a half, we decided to put her on Khan Academy. And so, six and a half years old, I don't really have to monitor her because that's kind of the point. It's a self-directed, learn-on-your-own system. So we taught her how to basically use it. It's very intuitive. It's easy for a young child to understand. And we'd cut her loose on that every other day or so for about 30 minutes. About a month or two into it, she comes up to me one day and she goes, Dad, I'm having a problem with a word. And I'm thinking to myself, a word? You're doing math. What do you have words for? And, she, and I go, what are you talking about? And she's like, what's obtuse? And I'm like, obtuse? You mean obtuse? She goes, yeah, and runs off. So I'm thinking to myself, obtuse, as in obtuse, acute, right angle, early trigonometric identities. So I walk over there, and I look over her shoulder. Yep, that's exactly what she's doing. She had already passed the lesson on degrees and radians, understanding what the difference is between degrees and radians, and had moved on to geometry and early trigonometric identities. And when she passed that lesson, and she did, she moved on to Pythagorean theorem, sines, cosines, and tangents. Of course, I had to put her on pause a little bit for that. 
only because she had completely stopped doing the subtraction and all that side of the tree, and she just started going down that side of the tree. <laughs> so I had to kind of get her to, you, know, you need to do a little bit of, you know, two minus one kind of stuff a little bit. But nobody, and I didn't tell her it was wrong. I said, that's amazing. Now let's go up here and do some of these ones. And she's like, okay. And so she started moving down the other side. Now she's doing three and four digit addition and subtraction and she's doing single and double digit multiplication. She's eight. Because this system, it's like a supplementary course and they're testing it in California. Working with the teacher as a referee in the class, not an authority figure, and the Khan Academy is being used so that the students can work with each other and teach each other and there are eighth graders doing differential calculus. And they don't know that they're not supposed to be doing differential calculus because nobody's telling them, well, that's a senior or college level course. Screw that. If they have the potential and the passion and they get to that level, do it. And of course, we all know, as education goes, so goes society. So now let's talk about one of the biggest ones, right? Energy. We have an energy problem. Oh my God, the world's going to fall apart. We're short on energy. No, we're not. We have a common sense problem. <laughs> Clean energy solutions are a part of the puzzle that need to be used in concert all together. It's not like we're trying to come up with one holy grail solution of cold fusion that's going to solve everything. All right? What you need is a reasonable approach based on geography, based on location, based on what's available, and mix a whole bunch of technical systems together to provide for the energy needs of a city or a home or a region. So we've got things like solar power. Everybody knows about good old-fashioned solar. And just recently, bottom left, photovoltaic paint, which is why you have a solar panel with some paintbrushes, right? So you can paint your home or car, and it will be the solar collector because of the nanoparticles that are involved. That's a pretty cool invention, don't you think? And recently on Zeit News, which was a website that I helped develop when I was the technology team lead, Zeit News posted recently a, well, thank you. <laughs> Zeit News posted uh, recently an article about a photovoltaic cell that works at night. It collects heat, thermal energy that's radiant throughout the evening and converts that into electricity. So now you've got solar panels that work at day and night. And you can paint them on. And you can put them in windows. You have photovoltaic windows. You're going to friggin' photovoltaic clothes thanks to nanomaterials. So there's no shortage of solar options. And you've got solar roadway. Now this is an amazing technology in and of itself. I have a link on the bottom. So if somebody wanted to go to solar roadways and look at some of the numbers, but let me just put this in short. If solar roadways were to replace all the major highway systems in the United States, we would be able to power the energy needs for the entire planet two to three times over. Yeah. We have an energy problem? No. We have a common sense problem. Not only that, but these roadways are obviously not based on fossil fuels because asphalt is created as a petroleum derivative. And if you do these as solar panels, which is glass made out of sand, so yeah, that's a lot easier to deal with, you also mitigate a lot of the dependency on oil and fossil fuels for just your basic highway and road systems. Now you've got two kinds of winds, small scale and large scale. Now small scale wind systems, see I'm not really a big fan of gigantic fans in the middle of nowhere that spin around and have huge distances in between them that are also hazardous to birds, other animals, and heaven forbid gravity actually pull down the blades so it ruins the gears on the top and they freeze or stop because they break down, or they're directionally dependent which means they have to face the wind in order to spin. Uh -uh. I'm more interested in vertical maglev wind turbine systems that are directionally independent of the wind, which means it doesn't matter which way the wind is blowing, these things always spin in the same direction, thanks to good old-fashioned aerodynamics. 
And because they're maglev, they're floating on magnetic bearings, there's no friction involved so that you can have a much lower wind cut-in speed, which means you can blow on it and it will spin. So you put these things on a 15-foot tower on the top of your house where the wind speed is about 17 or so miles an hour on any average day, and you have the potential of creating a pretty good energy system for your house. You mix that with a little bit of solar and a little bit of geothermal, and based on where you live, a little bit of hydro, etc., there is no energy problem. If you look at the picture on the right, Heaven forbid we actually put these on the light posts that are going down the highway. What happens when a car drives by? Generates a pretty good gust of wind, right? So now you have an electric car system so that when the cars drive by, it spins these vanes. Either direction the cars go, the vanes spin in the same way. During the day, it charges batteries at the bottom of the post, which will light the lights during the day, so every light is independent. So now we don't have to worry about power outages or grid fallout issues. So if something happens somewhere else, it has no effect on the lighting. So people can see where they're going and that increases safety, right? And you can run the entire, auto, you can run the entire highway lighting system off of these. And then you've got the big dogs. You got design systems that are out there. And by the way, for anybody who thinks I'm blowing smoke, I have a magazine in my book bag. It's from 2008, Popular Science, that talks about these in 2008. Less than five mile an hour wind cut in speed can serve over 750,000 homes with just one of these large scale vertical wind turbine systems. And if you put a cool little restaurant on the top, maybe a little motel or something, or a helicopter pad or whatever, you could make it an attraction in and of itself while it also serves the needs of the energy for the city that it's taken care of. Then you've got wave power. Waves go up, waves go down, waves go in, waves go out. What that does is push wind. So the thing on the right, the picture on the right, when the waves go up, causes wind to go one way. When the waves go out, it pulls the wind the other way. And the turbine on the inside spins the same direction all the time, no matter which way the wind is going. So in effect, it's like your lungs, breathing in, breathing out. And every time that happens, that turbine spins. And if you do this in the right way, you could make these very beautiful, artistic parts of the landscape, part of the beach, so that it would actually be an attraction and not an eyesore if it's done the right way. Heaven forbid we actually combine artists and engineers to make things amazing. And then we have our tidal systems. Basically, it's turbine spinning thanks to the flow of water. I mean, water is just a medium like air, so if wind systems can make fans turn, water systems can also make fans turn. And so when the tides go in and out, it can also create energy. The one on the bottom left, if done in the right way, could be turned into an artificial reef and might actually be a good bonus to the ecosystems that we're destroying in the first place. And it could generate energy at the same time. <laughs> geothermal, something that Iceland uses a lot, and there are geo geothermal vents all over the place that can be tapped. Again, regionally specific solutions that are most appropriate for that area of the planet. You start using geothermal with a little mix of everything else and you can definitely power individual homes in a smart grid system. Imagine a grid where you don't have, it's so funny, we get attacked a lot, right? Communism, central planning, you know, you've got all these authority figures on the top. Do you think the power systems that we have today aren't the most centrally planned, centrally controlled bunch of crap you've ever seen? Just ask Fukushima how that works. I mean, you lose a nuclear plant, entire half of a country goes down. And not to mention the fallout and the natural disasters and just built into that alone. We are highly centralized in the way we do energy production and it's highly monopolized. I have one power company to choose from where I live. Oh, thank you, free market. Bullshit. So, 
what if every house was a partial contributor to the grid? What if every building had a little bit of solar, a little bit of wind, some photovoltaic paint, you had your roads, you had this dynamic infrastructure, and it was a smart grid? Well, let's say you have one building that's generating 150% of its needs because everybody went home early, whatever reason, and you have another building on the other side of town that is 50% deficient on what it needs. The smart grid system will automatically funnel the energy surplus that that one building is creating to the other one, and they'll do it like that. This is my most fun one, piezoelectric. The dance floor on the upper left is being lit and powered by the people dancing on the dance floor. Piezoelectric basically uses vibrations, and that can generate electricity, and so as you're walking or dancing or whatever the case may be, you can generate power. So the people on the bottom right are standing on what effectively could be an artificial sidewalk or just a sidewalk with piezoelectric sensors in it. I want you to think about a high volume traffic area, say in like New York. Imagine if a New York sidewalk was piezoelectrically wired. Imagine the footsteps. If you had 100 people a minute only generating a half or a quarter of a volt of energy, just do the math. You're going to generate a crap load of power just by people walking on the sidewalk. And since we want to develop a world where people are more active and not sitting on their butts all day and they're out walking around and doing stuff, every sidewalk and every major walkway throughout the entire planet could be piezoelectrically wired in conjunction with all of the other energy solutions that I've just talked about. We don't have an energy problem. Fuel cell systems are pretty darn amazing, especially the Bloom system, which just recently came out. It is primarily made out of sand. It's very, very robust as far as its potential. Currently, it does work on natural gas, which is still better than some of the other fossil fuels, but they are working on a way to make it clean energy power through solar or other means, and that's going to happen. It's going to happen anyway. But if you look at some of the statistics on how these things work, one fuel cell can power a light bulb. You stack a few of them, you can power a house. Now look at the size of that stack in that person's hand. That could power your house, 40 of them. You put a whole bunch of them together, like a refrigerator, and you can power a Starbucks, which I love. <laughs> or you do a larger server, which is the size of a parking lot, and you can power up to 100 homes plus a little wind, plus a little solar. Gee, that sounds like a broken record, right? Now let's talk about some transportation. Now, we got electric cars. The Nissan Leaf is coming out. I kind of like Tesla's sporty look a little bit. So, you know, we've got those options as well. And, le and one of the biggest arguments against electric cars, of course, is that we don't have the infrastructure in place to, to, to recharge these things. Last time I checked, when the internal combustion engine was developed and cars were being made, nobody said, no, you can't invent the car yet. We don't have all the gas stations in place. It didn't work that way, did it? Yet all of a sudden now we're supposed to believe that that's how it's supposed to work, that we have to have all the gas stations in place before we're allowed to build the car? Screw that. No. You build the car and you retrofit and you phase out the crap gas stations that use fossil fuels and you implement the battery swap stations and the recharging centers that will allow the electric car to be the robust primary mode of transportation for the planet. Thank you, Fed. So I think we covered the robotic GPS driven car. It's okay, you're making my lecture go a little quicker, so that's fine. You also have additional systems like the Ultra Transport System, which is currently in test at Heathrow Airport, where you hop in. It's an A to B, almost like a taxi system. It's not on a free road, but it does follow along a, a preset primary path. So you just tell it where you want to go. And if the city is designed properly and it has a good uh, highway system designed for these vehicles, you just hop in, press a button, read a book, and it'll take you where you need to go, point A to point B. It's not like a bus, it's more like a taxi, but it's automated. And these already exist. In fact, I don't talk about anything that I can't prove in some kind of way through research statistics, links, or data. So, and I do have a source sheet for all of this. And if anybody wants the source sheet, find me on Facebook, Douglas Millett, Email me, and I'll send you the source sheet.
Then you've got bullet train systems, maglev systems, evacuated tube transport, which is basically a vehicle the size of a small van or a car that can hold four to six people. But you put it in a vacuum tube, you suck out 50 to 75 percent of the air. It doesn't have to be a hard vacuum-like space. You just want to reduce the drag enough so that that cool little pod can go, I don't know, 1,500 miles an hour. And it can be run on clean energy systems just like everything else. And you can go from New York to Hong Kong in, I don't know, six, seven hours maybe or less. Well, it depends. You know, you've got to accelerate at a reasonable rate and decelerate at a reasonable rate. You go from zero to 1,500 too fast and you're going to have a damn headache. So let's think about this. There's all kinds of solution sets out there that mitigate the energy problems, the transportation problems, allow us to be cleaner and greener with how we get around, allow us to build homes relatively quickly for emergency situations. I mean, it's not like we don't have a surplus of housing anyway. Um, there are more than enough homes in existence today to cover the needs of most of the first world, and we could use these advanced technologies to help the I don't want to say developing world or developed world. Those two words are kind of finite. Just help others in need. So after such abundant solution sets are implemented, there's a question. Can this current system handle that level of global sustainability? Now, I know a lot of you know the answer to this one. No, it can't. It was never designed to handle that level of efficiency, to handle that level of global sustainability. And so what I've done is I've kind of gone down and broken down some key elements here. What do we have now and what do we need? What we have now is a system based on scarcity. And what we need is a system based on technical abundance. What we have now is a system based on inefficient human labor as the main driver. Federico touched on this perfectly. A system, what we need is a system based on efficient technical labor as the main driver. Falling away are the days of human labor for income to survive. I do not find it unreasonable that every man, woman, and child born to this earth should automatically, by default, have abundant access to their biological and quality of life needs so that they can grow up and be the most productive, positive, amazing people this planet has ever known. We have a system based on cyclical consumption for constant growth, we need a system based on sustainability and balance. How many Earths do we have? How can you infinitely grow on a finite planet? That's retarded. It doesn't work. <laughs> so how do you expect an economic model to operate under that kind of thinking when you only have one planet and a certain amount of stuff? What we need to be doing is reuse, recycle, efficiently recycle. We don't exactly even do recycling very well these days. And I don't necessarily mean people participating. I mean some of what we recycle is energy inefficient. Just the recycling process is crap. And so those need to be revisited as well. Some people get the good old feely warm thing inside. I'm recycling. I'm green. S you realize some recycling practices are more energy inefficient than the original production of what you're trying to recycle? A lot of people should do more research as to what is worth recycling and what really isn't. We have a system based on ownership and control. We need a system based on usership, which I kind of made up, and open access. Well, that one kind of makes sense. I mean, if you look at where, where did ownership come from? You go back a couple of thousand years. Of course, that's kind of the system we're using, isn't it? Let's go back to the agricultural revolution, which is a little bit more recent. You had Farmer John sitting down doing their, uh, doing their work. And that was very human labor intensive. A lot of blood, sweat, and tears and emotion goes into it. There's an emotional connection to that labor. I worked hard for this. If some random schmuck comes up and starts taking all the food and walking off with it, that's likely going to piss you off, right? You put a lot of work into that and somebody just comes up and takes it. So you put a fence around it. Now I own this land. This is mine. 
And then if they hop the fence, you hire a security group. You get a couple of guys with some billy clubs to protect that land. Hello, police and military. So you can see where all of that starts to develop from just the simple practice of growing some food, but trying to maintain, maintain control over that. Now that, those concepts have graduated to so many different aspects of our lives that it almost seems normal when, quite honestly, it's abnormal. We should be more open source, open access, and sharing of information so that that schmuck who tried to take food from you doesn't need to take food from you. They can get their own. Or the systems are so robust that there's such a surplus of food, there's no need to steal in the first place. If you modify the environment, you can make it such that people don't even think of exhibiting aberrant behaviors because it doesn't make sense. We have a system based on outdated, multi-century old ideologies and institutions. I think we've pretty much hammered that one pretty good, right? What we need is a system based on forward thinking, adaptation, and emergence. Things are always changing. The earth is flat. I know it's flat. Look, damn it, if you look down there, it just whoosh, and stops. And if you go over there, your ass is going to fall off the edge. Go around the world, okay, a little bit of science, not so flat. New data, new information, new way of thinking about things. There is no way we are ever going to go into space. Are you crazy? Besides, that's flat too. Look, you can see it kind of like, it's just kind of up there and everything looks like it's in the same place, right? So there's no way we're going to go up there and go into space. Tranquility base, the eagle has landed, man on the moon. Okay, maybe we can go into space. New data, new information, new way of thinking. We are constantly upgrading what we think we know versus what we do know. Which is why I love being a science techno-engineering geek, because in the sciences, good scientists are always challenging what they think is the norm. Is E equals MC squared still valid? Let's test it and constantly go back and retest it. Because one day we're going to break it. And when we break it, we're going to develop a new way of understanding the universe, a new way of understanding nature, and that's only going to make us better. That's how the process works. Adaptation and emergence. Right now we have a system based on hostile competition, secrecy, and differential advantage. What we need is a system based on cooperation and collaboration. You see, I don't actually personally have a problem with competition, friendly competition. In fact, I am currently in competition with my best friend for physical fitness. I have a goal in a month and a half of being more in shape than he is. I'm at a disadvantage because he is genetically prone, being this taller Italian jackass, of just genetically having this ability to just be in better shape. I mean, he used to be a Chippendale dancer for crying out loud, and I'm challenging him in a physical fitness to get in shape. But you know what? That motivates me. Of course, whoever loses has to do a mile in a dress. So <laughs> I hope I win. <laughs> but see, that's friendly competition. That motivates you in a positive way. Because at the end of the day, What's it going to hurt when I'm going to run a mile in a dress? You know what, though? I'm going to be one physically fit, dress-running son of a bitch. <laughs> right? <laughs> At least as close as possible. I might not beat him, but I hope I tie him. And so, and likewise with the sciences, two scientists competing against each other to solve a problem. At the end of the day, the problem is solved, mankind is better for it, and those two scientists can hopefully go have a beer together and shake hands and understand what the real goal was. But economic competition in today's world kills people. And when you have that kind of competition where resources are hoarded, manipulated, wasted, and misconstrued in ways for the sake of profit and constant growth, people die. That kind of competition sucks. That's the kind of competition that we don't need anymore. But I'm okay with some friendly competition. <laughs> we
We have a today, system today where political opinion, influenced by financial contributions, dictate the ebb and flow of global operations. And we know this to be the case. That's how the game is played. I don't buy into all the conspiracy theory crap that there's a whole bunch of nefarious organizations controlling and manipulating. No, no, no. People are just playing the game really well. And if they want to get together as a group and, and collaborate and play the game that way, that's fine. I don't fault the people. The game sucks. And so our job is to change the damn game. And you can do it a lot of different ways. These are ways what we're doing it here, getting the awareness out. It's an erosion from the bottom up of getting people used to and adapted to technical solutions that better their lives. That's why I'm doing cybernated farm systems. People can do that for energy or transportation. There are ways to erode the system from the bottom up to lessen people's dependence on money to survive. That's the whole point, isn't it? Erode that dependency on money to live and eventually money becomes pointless. And that's what we're trying to get to. Rome wasn't built in a day, fed. But... <laughs> It is a process that we can undertake as a group, as a globe, as a collective working together to better mankind in our own way. Do what you're passionate about and do it with the RBE in mind. That is where you get to the point where the scientific method, in conjunction with human experience, the arts, technical foundations, things like that, will enhance the lives of all people. Mankind needs to improve to a new and upgraded global operating system. Right now, we're using Windows 1.0. We need to upgrade to Linux. <laughs> but remember, there are no utopias. I hate that word. I hate is too strong of a word. I strongly disapprove of that word. There are always going to be problems to address and ways to improve. New challenges that we're going to come up with, I don't know, like maybe space exploration or something like that, underwater sea exploration, going to the depths of this earth or going beyond it. Those kinds of challenges are the ones that we should be stepping up to. It shouldn't be a challenge to feed people on this planet anymore. It shouldn't be a challenge for everybody to have clean air and the ability to get around. It shouldn't be a challenge to provide energy systems that can cover everybody's needs. Those days, those challenges have been solved. It's time to move on to better challenges. We have new tools. We develop new tools and capabilities that require new ways of thinking. And when people throw out the utopia word, I go back to Neanderthal Cousin. I don't know if any of you know about him on YouTube. He's an amazing, amazing work that he does. And he made a video called The, the Mars Project. It's hilarious. So try to explain to a hunter-gatherer from 50,000 years ago, indoor plumbing. Now, we take indoor plumbing for granted. But to a hunter-gatherer, they're going to be like, what? You turn something called a tap, and you get hot or cold water anytime you want, no matter where you are, on demand? That's utopian. You're crazy. No, they're not going to understand that level. But for us, it's like every day. Well, let's not get into how is the water heated. Well, you've got, you know, water heaters or solar or, or energy systems. What's a house? You know, well, now you have to explain what a house is. And so let's just go down that path a little bit and you can see how crazy our world would seem to somebody from that far in the past. Fortunately, in today's world, we don't have to wait 50,000 years to upgrade the planet. We're simply moving from an established society to an emergent society. Because you see, global sustainability is something that already exists. It's something that was developed a long time ago. It's constantly being refined and redeveloped in new ways all the time, which is what zeitnews.org kind of showcases, or all these technical adjustments and these new ways of doing things. It's an amazing website that I hope many of you will be able to take a look at. A lot of people have it as their homepage, for crying out loud. We have the capabilities to do a lot, to use science, engineering, and technology for human concern. It's about time in the 21st century that we start actually behaving like 21st century stewards of this fertile planet. Thank you. No, thank you, Mr. Millette. 
Um, I hope you all enjoyed that, folks. I certainly did. And it really showcased another direction at which you can come at the train of thought from, which is to start with solutions and then work back to why we can't get there. Um, <coughs> something I'm going to attempt to do with my presentation or roughly speaking with my presentation this year at Z-Day London. So the next thing I'd like to move on to is the next bit of the first civilization. Just due to time constraints, because I've got to get on with my lecture and other p bits and bobs, I'm only going to read the next uh, couple of sections, which, which isn't too long. But uh, I certainly, after Z-Day, am going to make a concerted effort to get through the rest of this book, because I'm about halfway through, so I'm going to need to um, get a move on. So... We left off just before the section Life in an RBE, which is on page 30 of the PDF for the First Civilization, which you can um, get to online either through our website or just typing in the First Civilization, Jess Garcher, into Google, and, and you should come up with the, the book if you want to read along with James. So, Life in an RBE. We'll finish this chapter off by talking about what day-to-day -day life might look like in an RBE. The best way I can think of to show this would be for me to simply describe the hypothetical life that I might live in this kind of system. This is simply an example of the kind of life that would be possible in an RBE. I expect that everyone reading this would have wildly different ideas as to how they would spend their time. This is another great benefit of an RBE. Rather than all of us living nearly identical 9 to 5 lives, there would be a massive diversity in the kinds of lives that people would live. So here's how I think my life might look in an RBE. I would wake up in my temporary dwelling whenever I felt like it. After a healthy breakfast, I'd walk to the nearest transportation station and be whisked off to a research centre. Here, I would spend the day researching biological ageing, which is a particular area of interest to me. As the day began to grow late, I would head back home and print myself a customised water pipe. After an evening of smoking hemp and reading about theoretical physics, I would go to bed. The next day, I would travel to Picchu because I've always wanted to see it. The day after that, I might travel to the other side of the globe and spend the next few days teaching kids about what it was like to live during the Second Dark Ages, as I'm sure our modern era will be called in the future. When I wasn't teaching, I'd spend some time learning about nanotechnology and hopefully I would one day be able to contribute to research in that area as well. Perhaps I would spend the next few weeks jumping back and forth between labs and research topics. At some point, I'd probably get bored of this, so I'd travel over to what we call India and spend a month living in as close proximity to elephants as possible, likely with a research team. During this time, I would spend most of my days observing the elephants and practicing some musical instrument. I'll be honest, right now I'm picturing myself riding on the back of an elephant whilst playing the guitar. Also, there would be hemp involved. Eventually, I'd head back to the city and pull together some kind of band, probably making songs about my time with the elephants. Meanwhile, I would continue learning about a variety of subjects and spend the odd day doing research whenever the mood struck me. Eventually, I would probably return to that first lab and spend a few months dedicating as much time as possible to research. Then, I'd spend a few weeks just relaxing with friends and family, playing video games, reading and watching old movies before returning to the lab and continuing my research. And that is a brief glimpse of how I picture my life in an RBE. Hopefully, I would have friends joining me throughout the entire process, probably picking some up along the way. And none of these friends would ever be lost thanks to a new invention that will probably change daily life in the future in the same way that cell phones and the internet have changed our lives in the present. It's called Sixth Sense. Sixth Sense is essentially a small device with a built-in camera and projector that you wear around your neck like a medallion and is connected to a miniature computer in your pocket. The reason for the name Sixth Sense is that this device takes intangible digital information and brings that information into the physical world where we can interact with it, thus giving us access to new digital sense. 
The device works by projecting images onto a flat surface which you can interact with by using hand gestures which are tracked by the camera. Some actions which are possible include taking pictures using just your hands, drawing an image on the wall without actually leaving a permanent picture on said wall, and even projecting a circle onto the ground and kicking it around with your friends. Seriously. Since the device is connected to the internet and in an RBE the various global databases, it allows a person to access a huge amount of data wherever they are and interact directly with that data using their own hands. This could also mean that devices such as cell phones would become obsolete. You could interact with someone on the opposite side of the planet any time you were near a flat surface or just substitute your hand when no other surface was available. Although this amazing device is currently in rather bulky prototype form, it will eventually become much smaller and more convenient to travel with, like virtually every other kind of technology. I could talk on and on about this amazing creation, but I will end for now by saying that this device will almost certainly become as ubiquitous in the future as cell phones are today. And of course in an RBE, the device would be freely given to anyone who wants one, thus creating a new kind of digital global consciousness, one that permeates the real world rather than sticking us all behind computer monitors. I highly recommend that you search this device online, especially if you want a much better explanation of what it can do than the one I've given here, which really doesn't do it justice. Some final thoughts. A resource-based economy is a radical idea that is unlike anything that has ever been attempted in human history. Perhaps the most interesting aspect of this new system is that by taking advantage of advanced technology, we would actually be restoring our former balance with nature. For the majority of human history, the human species lived in relative harmony with its environment. The environmental changes we imposed were gradual enough and subtle enough that we were not a major cause of environmental destruction. Instead, we were just another natural part of the ecosystem, like all of the other plants and animals. However, somewhere along the line this balance was lost. We became more concerned with things that did not exist in the physical world than things that did. Our concern turned to intangible constructs such as wealth, property and politics. And we lost sight of the things that actually contribute to the health of our species, such as food, air and water. As our technology became more advanced, we suddenly found that we were able to harvest vast quantities of resources, but there was a price. The more powerful our technology became, the greater its negative impact on the environment became. It seems that this technology was actually not very advanced at all, but was really still quite primitive. Truly advanced technology would logically speaking be able to enhance the power of our species while simultaneously balancing this power with the impact we have on the environment. Our species has now reached a point where this kind of advancement is actually within our grasp. However, we continue to cling to our mostly primitive technologies even though they are less powerful, less efficient and less sustainable than more advanced alternatives. This is largely due to our refusal to let go of the intangible constructs which have now become more important to our species than the real world. If we are able to overcome this barrier to our progress, we might at last be able to reach a state in which we can balance the technological power of the modern age with the sustainability of our ancestors. Furthermore, by creating a society in which restrictive concepts such as government and law were no longer necessary, we would restore the natural freedom that we lost with the establishment of human civilization. We would at last be able to create a society that was truly civilized, one where people do not have to be forced into acting a certain way through fear of punishment, but rather choose to act a certain way because it actually benefits them. A true civilization would be one in which people actually consider the impact of their actions and give honest consideration to the state of the future. The last few decades of intense scientific progress have signalled the beginning of the end for our primitive way of life. The present day represents the final stage in the evolutionary jump from wild animals 
to intelligent citizens of the planet. If we continue to hold on to our old ways, we are simply digging ourselves deeper and deeper into the grave that has been marked for our species. If we are able to let go of our evolutionary baggage, we will finally be able to have the best of both worlds, the power of technology and the harmony and freedom of nature. But let's not get too excited yet. As you were reading this section, it's almost certain that you had a number of logical concerns regarding the RBE concept. Since this idea began to gain some popularity, it has been faced with a number of objections that question its feasibility. From the perspective of a scientific theory, this is perhaps the best thing that could possibly happen. No great idea can be complete unless it is thoroughly criticised and is able to overcome its criticisms with sound logic. This is what I hope to accomplish in the following section, so let's get to it. Or not, as the case may be, because I'm going to stop reading there. The next section is section two, questions and concerns, uh, which should get very interesting, because as that last paragraph says, and rightly so, you should want to be questioned on this. You should want to find holes. As I said a few radio shows ago, and I've heard Peter say before, please, for crying out loud, prove this wrong so I can just get back to playing the drums. I just want to rock out to Guns N' Roses, guys. <laughs> you know, this uh, this changing the world shits for the birds. <laughs> Sorry, Peter, I had to steal that from you. Uh, but yeah, just as, um, as Peter said as well, uh, you, you know, we love it really, uh, don't you guys? And, and that re really is important to keep one eye on that fact, guys. It, you, it's easy to walk around saying everything's shit and we're going to the dogs. But actually, everything really is amazing. But no one's happy. In other words, what's all this technology if all we're going to do with it is use it to enslave us and be ungrateful for the life to which we are enslaved? We could instead be grateful for the technology that we have been handed down by our ancestors and which we probably don't have much of a clue of how to make it ourselves. And of course, in a monetary system, why do you have to care? As long as you've got the money to pay for it, you don't have to worry about where it came from. You don't have to worry about where it's made. So this lays on fair attitude is um, to be expected, I would argue. You know, if your laptop breaks down, you just go, oh, it's just a pain, isn't it? You don't really take into consideration the fact that you didn't have a clue how the thing was made and you actually don't know what you're talking about. And you're very fortunate to even have half a working laptop, let's face it. It's that understanding plus using our technology to actually lift up mankind and alleviate suffering that really should be the gravitation of our species on this planet. On that note, I'll pass you over to Lewis C.K. Enjoy. And I'll see you soon, guys. Take care. Those were simpler times, I think. I just feel like we may be going back to that, by the way. But uh, <laughs> in a way, good. Because when I read things like the foundations of capitalism are shattering, I'm like, maybe we need that. Maybe we need some time where we're walking around with a donkey with pots clanging on the sides. You, you know? think that would just bring us back to reality? Yeah, because everything is amazing right now and nobody's happy. Like, in my lifetime, the changes in the world have been incredible. When I was a kid, we had a rotary phone. We had a phone that you had to stand next to and you had to dial it. Yes. Do you, know, you realize how primitive, you're making sparks <laughs> in a phone and you actually would hate people with zeros in their numbers because it was more it was right. like, oh, this guy's got two zeros. Screw that guy. Why do I want to? Yeah. Ugh. <laughs> and then if, you, if they called and you weren't home, the phone would just ring lonely by itself. And then if you wanted money, you had to go in the bank for when yes. it was open for like three hours. You just stay in line, write yourself a check like an idiot. And then when you run out of money, you just go, well, I can't do any more things now. <laughs> right. I can't do any more That's things. That's it, yeah. That was it. And even if you had a credit card, they, the guy would go, ugh, and he'd bring out this whole shunk shunk, and he'd write yes. all cruddy. You'd have to call the president to see if you have any money. And it's all true, kids. You had to call the president, yeah. 
It was ridiculous. Yes. Do you feel that we now, in the 21st century, we take technology for granted? Well, yeah, because now we live in an, in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the, on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots <laughs> that don't care, because this is what people are like now. They got their phone, and they're like, ugh, it won't... Give it a second! <laughs> give, it's going to space! Can you give it a second to get back from space? Is the speed of light too slow for you? Yeah. Yeah. I was on a, I was on an airplane and there was internet, high speed internet on the airplane. That's yes. the newest thing that I know exists. And I'm sitting on the plane and they go, open up your laptop, you can go on the internet. And it's fast and I'm watching YouTube clips. It's I'm in an airplane. And then it breaks down. And they apologize, the internet's not working. The guy next to me goes, this is bull****. <laughs> like, how quickly the world owes him something yes. he knew existed only 10 seconds ago. Right. Right. And on planes... <laughs> flying is the worst one, because people come back from flights and they tell you their story. And it's like a horror story. It's they act like their flight was like a cattle car in the 40s in Germany. That's yeah. how bad they make it sound. Right. They're like, it was the worst day of my life. <laughs> First of all, we didn't board for 20 minutes. Right. And then we get on the plane and they made us sit there on the runway for 40 minutes. We had to sit there. Oh, really? What happened next? Did you fly through the air incredibly? <laughs> Like a bird, did you partake in the miracle of human flight, you non-contributing zero, that you got to fly? You're flying! It's amazing! Everybody on every plane should just constantly be going, oh my god! Wow! Yes! You're flying! You're, you're sitting in a chair in the sky. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's right. Now, Louis, but, but it doesn't, it doesn't go back a lot, <laughs> and it's, and it's not really, little. you know, here's the thing, people, like, they say there's delays on flights, yeah. delays, really, New York to California in five hours, that used to take 30 years <laughs> to do that, and a bunch of you would die on the way there and have a baby, you'd be a whole different group of people by the time you got there, <laughs> now you watch a movie and you take a dump in your home, yeah,